Charlie Waite is one of the UK's best-loved landscape photographers. He started life as an actor, but fell in love with photography in the 1980s. Since then, his work has been published in around 30 books. He also runs photography workshops and holidays with his company Light and & Land, and launched the hugely successful Landscape Photographer of the Year competition, which is now in its 10th year. I spoke to him in his Dorset studio about three of his images. Hi Charlie, thank you for inviting us here today. We're going to be talking about three of your pictures uh, and I understand this first one was taken in the Lake District, is that right? It was, it really was. And um, in fact, one of those wonderful occasions where that pre-visualisation and the planning, you know, and all of that stuff, it sort of comes together and eventually with a little bit of tenacity, determination, hope, it happens and it's a very enjoyable process. And so, for, for you, part of the experience is actually just the being there, perhaps as much as taking the picture. That is the best thing anybody has really said to me. It's so true, Elsa, that's exactly what it is. And if you're not fully engaged with the whole business of being there, you, you definitely will be the poorer for it. Mm. So this picture in particular, what sort of time of day was it? Was it late in the day with that light? Yes, it was actually. It was sort of mid-afternoon mid on an autumn day, so the, the sun's quite low. And I think that's the great thing about um, looking up. I think very few uh, students we have with Light and Land, now it's better, but they used to not ever look up mm. to see what the, what the relationship was between the sky and the land beneath. And once you can orchestrate up there with down here, you're really in business. Mm. I have a feeling that the brain and the eye are an amazing kind of double act. And they, when you arrive, what, is, what lies behind the impulse to want to make a photograph in the first place? You, you, it's a sort of an amazing kind of rapid scanning process. You know, tuk, 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 and then you think, oh yes, I think I'll do a photograph here. So technically, was there anything you had to deal with for it. Yes, the, the um, filtration has always been part of the, the entire photographic process. What you're doing is you're just very, very subtly with amazing restraint and a lot of care, you're using filtration to produce an image that has parity with what you've already done here in your mm. head. But in this case, a graduated filter, very, very subtle, 0.45 I think, just to slightly prevent this uh, rather paler area of the sky, in a way beckoning the eye of the viewer. Because mm. you don't want some little bright bit of sky saying, hey, come and look at me, mm. I'm much more interested. It has to be about this, doesn't it? It has to be yeah. about the tree. But you're really trying to uh, produce an image with a sky that equated to what you saw. It, it's so rewarding to be able to orchestrate your filtration, your exposure, as one sort of entire entity on its own, made up of different considerations. And then when you get the result back, in the way that you did with the transparency, you looked at the tranny on the light box and you said, that's what I did and I got it right. So this next picture, there's two things at play here, I suppose, aren't there? Because the panoramic format is notoriously difficult to get right. And also you're in Bolivia, so you have to get it right. So tell me a bit about the story behind this one. Well, um, there's a certain amount of good fortune uh, involved, I have to say. Firstly, uh, altitude sickness, which has got nothing whatsoever to do with photography, but on that occasion it really did have a lot to do with it, mm. in that it was a, a horrible period of um, a bad weather coupled with me not feeling well. And when I recovered, the weather recovered. Right. And I got to a, a little island in the middle of Lake Titicaca, where it was, and I found this um, rather delightful little thatched contraption, for want of a better word, what was particularly interesting was that there was nothing else. And so I wasn't really quite sure what to do. I thought, mm. that, that isn't enough. I need something else. And the wind was just beginning to get up. And then enter stage left. We talked about serendipity, or perhaps even greater powers, dare I say. Mm. Enter stage left was a boat with a sail and a blue sail. Not pink, not green, not yellow, but blue. The same blue as Lake Titicaca. I mean, diabolical bit of good fortune. 
and then the relationship was secure between the sail of the boat, uh, which is triangular, of course, and the triangular nature mm. of the little thatch. Mm. And so you're at altitude. Obviously, the, the light, the atmosphere at that sort of altitude is different from when you're photographing down the road in Dorset. So, again, technically speaking, did, you know, what sort of filter did you need for this, this kind of scene here? Well, you're absolutely bang on about that. Altitude gives phenomenal clarity, and it had rained for about five, five or six days. So um, a very mild graduated filter uh, is always, I think, handy to have, as well as sometimes a strong one, and a polarizing filter, but not used too much. A polarizer is a bit like alcohol. It's, it's great at the time, <laughs> but afterwards, the next day, you don't feel so good. So I always think a polarizer shouldn't produce a blue that could so easily become violet or indigo mm. and not reminiscent of a pure blue. And so you have to use it with great restraint. In fact, all filtration should be done with restraint and with, with real care. So when you talk about using the polarizer with restraint, does that mean you didn't rotate it fully so that it was fully polarized? Did yes. you not, send not it back a little bit? Send it back a little bit. And I always think it's quite a good idea to take a polarizer and look through it yourself before putting it on the camera. Yeah. Because a polarizer will have an effect on something, somewhere, all of the time. The polarizer will have an effect on, on any surface that reflects light. Mm. And it could even be the thatch, the top of my head, the sail, you know, even a reed, a piece of foliage, anything. It increases contrast to a degree. So it has to be done very judiciously. Mm. And, uh, and yes, not all the way. It's quite a good idea just to say, where will I... Right, that's what my polarizer is doing it at this particular uh, rotation. What is it doing elsewhere? Mm. What effect is it having elsewhere? And then trying to find a happy medium. Yeah. And so would the area of graduation be, have been just on the clouds or would it have been lower than that? Because you've got the sail here to consider, haven't yes, you? Yes, very good point. Um, in an alpine setting, a graduated filter gets quite upset, but it's perfectly manageable. That's one of the reasons that you get a soft grab, which is so effective. But you're quite right, it hasn't clipped the mm. top of the sail. So it's just nudged into the top of the, of the clouds, which thankfully were all on the same pretty well horizontal line. So this last shot that we're going to talk about, I understand is fairly local to you. So how important is that aspect of photography to you, to have places nearby that you can revisit in any conditions at any time of year? It's very important, and I wish I could discover more little secret places. I think one thing that's rather magical is finding a particular vantage point that one likes and enjoying seeing it, obviously, you know, in different performances. And I have a little phrase I rather like, nature suspended in one of its most perfect performances. It requires late afternoon sunlight, and it's got to be roughly about this time of year, you know, sort of very, very early spring, needs low light. Because again, with any landscape, you know, and any painter, I think, would probably feel much the same. Oblique light is always really handy to try and create shadows. And the relationship between highlights and shadows are terribly important, again, to talk about really that sense of dimension, sense of depth we were discussing earlier. So shadows play a huge part, I think, in landscape photography. Mm. And so what was the light doing on this occasion? Was it moving quite quickly? Did you have much time to think, really? Well, it was moving quite quickly, and that's rather enjoyable when the, the um, configuration of sky and light and landscape underneath and the relationships between all three of them. Really, when you have moving clouds that are going quite fast with wind at high altitudes, you can utilise um, the sky in a, in a particular way, I still felt that it needed just to be increase the contrast a little bit between the amphitheatre feel and the background, which again worked very well indeed because I don't think it's obtrusive. I think it, mm. it was a genuine shadow. I don't think you can use a graduated filter of any strength to sort of masquerade as a shadow. Mm. You know, a shadow 
has to be a shadow and the dark sky has to already be dark, you, it's very, very, uh, I think, foolish to try and, and suggest that a, a sky which had no rain in it um, did have and it's really impossible to produce. So you really want to use a graduated filter to enhance what already prevails mm. and just to slightly increase it to a, a very, very mild amount. And that it was already a very dark sky, full of rain. In fact, it is raining in the distance over here. Mm. So I just wanted to be able to use a, a grad, as we call them, very, very subtly. And actually, and there's no harm in this, it's a very good idea, bring it down slightly yeah. over the horizon itself. Yeah. And that's very nice to do it in uh, pre-putting it on the camera. So you just hold it up to your eye with care. And you just go up and down, up and down, up and down. You familiarize yourself with where it's going to, the effect it's going to have, and then yeah. pop it on. It, it's, it's so much more rewarding mm. to be able to observe and witness and analyze and determine where you want to place your graduated filters. So you cook the meal all in one go, you come back in the way that we did with transparencies and you say to your printer, print as is. Print it just like you saw the transparency. And uh, I think that's hugely pleasurable. Mm. Well, it's been really interesting to, to talk about these pictures and learn a bit more about them. So thanks very much. Thank you.